Bienvenue to Welcome to Reporters here on France 24. I'm Mark Owen. In this edition, the future of Puerto Rico, a place that is an image of Caribbean paradise, but it's also a place that's been struck by natural disaster, which has left it struggling. And Puerto Ricans are more and more moving to mainland America. Laurence Cavillier is our reporter. She joins us now. Laurence, Puerto Rico to many people seems like, well, it seems like paradise, I suppose. So what is it that's making people want to get out? Well, they leave the island mainly in search for better job opportunities. In Puerto Rico, the minimum wage is still at $7.25, with prices consistently higher than in the mainland. And yes, statistics are quite dire. If there is no major shift in the trend, the population could go from 3.5 million today to barely 2 million in 2050. Uh, that migration also provoked an imbalance in age and gender groups since more men and immigrate. Today, there are less than nine men for every 10 women. So Puerto Rico could be the perfect destination for your next holidays, but making a life there doesn't seem so attractive if you were born there. Laurence Cavillier, thank you very much indeed. Let's take a look then at this report by Laurence and uh, Mathieu Coman. Puerto Rico, a name that means wealthy port. It's true, with its exuberant nature and its tourist attractions, the small Caribbean island should be synonymous with abundance. And yet, those who live here dream of living elsewhere. In the past 10 years, more than one out of 10 Puerto Ricans have emigrated, mostly young people. Victor Diaz, a former fraud inspector, now lives here without his family. I have a deep love for this island because I was born here. But my family, especially my sons, had to immigrate to the United States. The economic situation forced them to do so. Wherever you look, there are empty homes and abandoned warehouses. With his meager pension, Victor is struggling to make ends meet. He wanted to host tourists, but in 2017, Hurricane Maria swept away the entire third floor of his house. He had to start from scratch. The pension I receive does not cover my real needs. I receive $961 a month. How do you expect me to get by, to live decently? I would need $1,500 and without allowing myself any luxuries. Since the beginning of the pandemic, cruise ships no longer sail in front of his house. He only sees the ocean liners loaded with goods imported from the United States with a steep markup. For Victor, the island's ambiguous status, not really integrated to the United States nor free to govern itself, is unsustainable. We have to solve this problem. We either become independent because there are not islands that are smaller than ours and with fewer natural resources, and they're not doing so badly. It takes a lot of effort, but they're doing well, and they don't depend on a fake economic injection. An annexation would be good too, because we have a different relationship with the United States as a state in our own right. We wouldn't be this kind of colony that they invest in for profit. This status is partly responsible for the economic disaster that's been going on since the early 2000s. It's been a series of unfortunate events. In 2006, the end of tax privileges provoked a massive departure of investors and manufacturing jobs, followed by an austerity plan where 30,000 civil servants were dismissed and 400 schools were closed. Then, two natural disasters, Hurricane Maria in 2017 and earthquakes in 2019. The island is now in debt, to the tune of $70 billion. In order to continue providing basic public services, it will have to repay 80% of it as soon as possible. This is not an option at this time. The governor is pushing for full integration with the United States. This would allow them to declare themselves bankrupt and restructure this debt which they can't do under their current status. In my opinion, it is better that we finally have access to all the rights that American citizens have, while preserving our culture, our language, our way of being. To begin with, 
we would have just a handful of Puerto Ricans in Congress, two senators and four representatives. And they would defend the interests of Puerto Rico all the time. But it's not a done deal. A delegation will plead the island's case and formally request annexation in the coming weeks. But the state's poor economic health could hinder the process. I'm going to be quite fair. All the territories that became states in the last 100 to 150 years were economically lagging behind compared to the other states. What I think will happen with us is what happened to Hawaii, Alaska, New Mexico, Arizona, Florida. When they were not yet states, they used to say about them, New Mexico? They don't even speak English. They're underdeveloped. Florida? That's just a big swamp. But some of them have no desire to knock on Uncle Sam's door. Buenos días, mi gente, buenos días. Estamos a través de Radio Casa Pueblo 1020 AM, la primera emisora comunitaria ecológica de Puerto Rico desde Adjuntas, Pueblo Solar. In Adjuntas, in the Central Mountains, the organization Casa Pueblo prefers building independence. Through a local radio station, the production of coffee and vegetables, but above all, through a battle for energy independence. The goal is to give young Puerto Ricans the desire to stay. Of course, this is a question that I ask myself every day. For example, I studied literature, and if I want to work in this field, well, unfortunately, there's nothing for me here. It's very sad, but initiatives like Casa Pueblo try to raise awareness about this. Thanks to the donations of a foundation and the participation of dozens of volunteers, more than 200 buildings, including all the small businesses in the city center, are now powered by solar energy. Arturo Masol and his parents started the project in 1998, but it got a big boost three years ago. When Hurricane Maria passed in 2017, Casa Pueblo became the community's energy oasis because we were already running on solar. People would come in, hook up their respiratory therapy machines, charge their phones. Then we gave out 14,000 solar bulbs so people could have light again. But it was mostly to teach them how to harvest solar energy. We strongly believe the country can produce the energy it needs and break this pattern of dependence on the United States. The issue of energy is virtually a way to decolonize. Casa Pueblo's model is spreading. Ada and Eva have become photovoltaic energy technicians. They are now considering their future in adjuntas. This isn't new. Emigration has been a problem for many years. In fact, when we started our training, the objective of the foundation that supported the project was very clear, to train women in the trade. Because they know that women are the center of families and have stronger ties to their homes. Whereas men often train, but very quickly feel the need to go elsewhere to practice their craft. Energy, for many locals, is the focal point of this battle. 95% of the island still depends on fossil fuels, imported at a high price from the United States, costing $2 billion per year. For Edilberto, the change was decisive. Here in Adjuntas and everywhere in Puerto Rico, electricity is very expensive. Sometimes it's the reason why a business has to close. I have colleagues who pay five, six, or even $7,000 a month. Edilberto's restaurant is now self-sufficient in energy, which has allowed him to resist the difficult times of COVID-19. But for the rest, the United States is still present everywhere. Puerto Rico produces only 15% of the food consumed by its people. The island is not even allowed to have trade relationships with other countries. For example, if we look at milk, this is half a gallon. Here, the average price is around $3. 
whereas in the United States, it costs on average a dollar twenty-five and a dollar fifty-five, which means in reality we get a lot of things that are imported from the U.S. or they enter the United States and then are sent here. So we pay a double tax because the U.S. passes on the export tax they pay to the country of origin, and we afterwards pay another tax to bring the product here. And transportation to the island is expensive. Excessively high prices, while 42 percent of the inhabitants live below the poverty line. Twenty years ago, Puerto Rico was the fifth largest producer of pharmaceuticals in the world. But the end of tax privileges for companies in 2006 caused a collapse of the activity. Carmen Saratini made her whole career at the prosperous GlaxoSmithKline plant in Sidra. The company was a big part of our little town. They funded schools. In the summers, they would open their doors to students to work as interns. The closure took us by surprise. The products we were launching were very successful. And after the closing, we started to see other very solid companies close, one after the other. A series of crises that pushed Puerto Ricans over the edge. In 2019, they took to the streets en masse. A series of corruption scandals had just shaken the political sphere. The anger of the residents exploded when they heard leaked conversations in which the former governor mocked the hurricane victims. Ayola Virela covered this moment closely for her newspaper. These were really shocking words, and these protests were clearly directed against the local government. This unprecedented episode exacerbated tensions between supporters of annexation to the United States and the independence. In Puerto Rico, I believe that more than half of the people think that the presence of the United States is indispensable, that we can't do without this relationship for our economic health and to enforce the law in cases of corruption. But I also think that there is a whole generation of young Puerto Ricans who have not experienced any prosperity. They lived through a series of corruption scandals, hurricanes, earthquakes, and now the pandemic. So they don't necessarily see the benefit of this dependent relationship. And they think, why not take our destiny into our own hands? Is the United States the only option for prosperity or just a false and poisonous ally? Many felt Donald Trump's visit in 2017 was a symbolic gesture of the United States' attitude toward Puerto Ricans. As the Caribbean was devastated by Hurricane Maria, the head of state threw paper towels at the victims, while accusing them of costing the federal government too much. He just came to promote his own figure, but here it had the opposite effect. Because by throwing paper rolls at us, he just disrespected us. Always in tension between staying or leaving, Victor and his compatriots remain at the mercy of an uncertain future. If I stay here, it's because I don't have enough money to leave. If I see the economic situation improve somehow, then I might stay. But if it keeps getting worse, I think that in order to have a better quality of life, I need to leave. But the status quo will not be easy to break. There aren't enough reasons to convince Washington of annexation, nor enough support from Puerto Ricans for the independence project. For now, Puerto Rico remains trapped in its status as a free associated state, not truly free, nor fully associated. Our reporter, Lawrence Cavillier, is still with us. Lawrence, thank you very much for that insight into Puerto Rico. Uh, split between those who, who want to kind of integrate into the United States and those who want to be uh, independent. I wonder, on the ground, what feeling did you notice is larger? 
Uh, well, a referendum last year showed support of a majority of Puerto Ricans to the annexation project with 52% uh, voting in favor. And that's indeed what I felt on the ground. Uh, I talked to an entrepreneur who put things very clearly. What do I need to succeed in life? do business in dollars and have an American passport. But partisans of independence might have louder voices on their sides, uh, artists, academics, intellectuals, uh, activists such as Artur Masol, who we've heard in this report, are broadly in favor of independent, uh, independence. Now, that's actually a three-sided issue because many people are simply in favor of the statu quo. Uh, they argue that it's not worth trying to convince Washington and that their current status is not so bad after all. But let's hear uh, Governor Pedro P Pierluizzi's take on this issue. I know that we will remain proud of our Hispanic roots, our traditions, and our culture. And that's also an advantage for the United States. It would allow them to have an island in the Caribbean which would belong to their nation in a permanent manner. It would be positive for them. Some here are worried that becoming a state would make us lose our identity. But I'm not worried about that. I think we'll see the same thing as we've seen with Hawaii and Alaska. In those states, there are independence movements to this day. And with all due respect, I believe we would see the same thing here. That won't change. Governor Pierre Luisi there. Lawrence, um, Puerto Rico, it's fair to say, um, in an economic quagmire right now, what could the um, economic planks possibly be? to put in place to stop it sinking even further? Well, now the manufacturing sector seems definitely excluded. Tourism remains the main advantage of this island with its many natural attractions, its good security conditions and a dollar-based economy. Uh, one sector that could prosper in the coming years is agricultural production. 85% of uh, what Puerto Ricans consume is imported and everyone agrees that developing local production would generate significant benefits both for job creation and for making basic goods more affordable. And Lawrence, with the change of administration in, in the White House, Joe Biden, now the president, is there a sense in Puerto Rico that it's a kind of now or never moment? Well, there sure is a change of tone from the federal government towards Puerto Rico. In September last year, while he was still speaking as a candidate, uh, Joe Biden uh, showed support to the project of fully integrating Puerto Rico to the United States. Uh, he said there is an urgent need to improve infrastructure and education on the island. But he said uh, this is for the Puerto Ricans and the Congress to decide. Now, as the Democrats have the majority in the House of Representatives, but are tied in the Senate, this could actually be a good moment for Puerto Rico as the island seems to be leaning towards the Democrats. And having a couple of votes more in the Congress could actually be a selling point for the Democrats. Lawrence Cuvillier, thank you very much indeed. You can see the report by Lawrence and Matthew Coma again uh, on our website, France24.com. This is Reporters on France24. Stay with us. Most of all, stay safe.